On Monday the 2nd of November 1992, children's television presenter Sarah Green appeared on the children's BBC television programme to reassure her audience that she had not, in fact, been killed by a ghost. The reason for this was a horror mockumentary broadcast on BBC One on Halloween over 30 years ago. Written by Stephen Volk and directed by Leslie Manning, the drama was produced for the BBC anthology drama series Screen One by Richard Broke, Ruth Baumgardner and Derek Nelson. Though the production team wanted it to look realistic, shortly before its transmission, the programme featured on the cover of the Radio Times, inside which it was explained that it was a drama. Despite this and opening credits added at the broadcaster's insistence to make sure everyone could see that this was not real, many viewers did in fact believe they were watching genuine live events. The reason for the confusion is that the 90 minute film worked very hard at its verisimilitude, presenting itself as a live broadcast, starring real TV presenters playing fictional versions of themselves and featuring shaky cam, accidental appearances by TV equipment and a call-in number audience members could use, with a few of the callers seemingly being featured in the show. Another aspect which adds to the illusion of liveness was, paradoxically, the fact each side of the camera feed was filmed separately days or even weeks apart. Because of this, there are many instances where studio presenters had to re-ask questions to fill gaps before someone will answer, the kind of lag which often happens when a live feed isn't instantaneous, but which a fictional programme would normally just cut for pacing. The setting of the film also helped. As Michael Parkinson says at the beginning of the broadcast, there are no creaking gates, no gothic towers, no shuttered windows. The location of the house in Northolt, Greater London, the family themselves and the interior of the house would be familiar to a British audience in their normality, comforting at least at first. Many other aspects are also familiar. The case clearly draws inspiration from and parallels the famous Enfield Poltergeist. This case recently inspired The Conjuring 2, one of the only Conjuring universe films we haven't covered yet, mainly because I, I really struggled to get through it. It also occurred in London and involved psychokinetic activity, as well as a spirit speaking through a young girl in a demonic sounding voice and an ambiguously supernatural photo taken in a child's bedroom. Other embellished but established historical or parapsychological events include the 19th century practice of baby farming and many staples of modern ghost hunting shows such as motion detectors, temperature sensors, covert and thermographic camera, fictional characters being affiliated with real world paranormal organisations such as the Society for Psychical Research and the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. You are further lulled into a false sense of security when, as in most ghost hunting programs, nothing really happens for the first half hour or so. Some of the past events even get debunked. The reporters don't appear to be taking the story seriously, apart from paranormal researcher Dr. Lynn Pascoe, played by Gillian Bevan. And one of them, Craig Charles, resorts to playing Halloween pranks on the others to liven things up. What a cheeky chappy. <laughs> It's only as the program goes on that the phoned in ghost stories, experiences in the house, revelations in the studio, all reveal the existence of the malevolent spirit, Pipes. The show created a visceral response, its 11 million viewers making an estimated 1 million phone calls to the BBC switchboard on the night of broadcast. Many of them praised the show for its then unique presentation, but roughly 30,000 were from angry and frightened viewers, including Parkinson's elderly mother who really thought her son was in danger. At one point, more than 20,000 people were trying to get through to Parkinson during the programme. Despite the BBC's partial advertising of the show's fiction, many thought it was real. Many people felt the BBC was something they could trust and so the film took them by surprise and made them feel stupid for seemingly violating that trust. The majority of people missed the opening credits, tuning in late after a film finished on ITV and therefore thinking that they were watching something live. The first thing the Ghostwatch helpline told people when they rang up was, this is not real. However, the high number of calls jammed up the line and many people who telephoned simply got an engaged tone. This commonly happened when phoning BBC call-in shows, inadvertently adding to the realism instead of reassuring viewers that it was fiction. Writer Stephen Volk was later told three pregnant women went into labour that evening due to the programme, and a vicar phoned in to complain that even though he realised it wasn't real, he thought the BBC had raised demonic forces. Much more serious was the suicide of 18-year-old Martin Denham. 
Martin took his life in Nottingham, five days after watching Ghost Watch. His family blamed the TV film for his suicide, as Denham, who had learning difficulties, had been quite agitated watching it and became convinced the banging of pipes inside his own walls were caused by ghosts. Even before this tragedy, British tabloids and other newspapers criticised the BBC for the disturbing nature of some scenes. Ghostwatch earned the dubious honour of being the first TV programme to be cited in the British Medical Journal as having caused PTSD in children, though this didn't last more than a few days and was probably therefore more a brief period of anxiety rather than full-on PTSD. A judicial review by the BSC concluded that the show was excessively graphic and hadn't done enough to tell its audience what it really was. The film's producers argued that Ghostwatch had aired during a drama slot, that it was recognisable as fiction to a vast majority, and that running disclaimers or other announcements during the programme would have ruined its effectiveness. They also stated that, had they anticipated the audience reaction, they would have made its fictional nature clearer. However, after the BSC ruling, they issued an apology. Because of this, Ghostwatch has never been repeated on UK television, though international broadcasts, streaming repeats and DVD releases are all a different story. Despite the controversy, Ghostwatch remains much loved. The film was met with positive responses from both fans and critics alike at the time and came in at number 41 in Channel 4's 100 Greatest Scariest Moments. Its influence is visible in much of what followed, including Derren Brown's Seance and the 2020 British Zoom-based horror film Host, which contains many references to Ghostwatch, including a Zoom caller ID of 31101992, referring to the date of Ghostwatch broadcast. Stories that it also inspired the Blair Witch Project, the first mainstream cinema success story of found footage, are unconfirmed. Since the show's 18th anniversary, fans have celebrated the film with a live event dubbed National Seance, where they play their personal recordings of the show at precisely 9.25, just as Ghost Watch was originally broadcast. Even without the power of nostalgia, it is still easy to see what made this film such a phenomenon, and not just because the writer of this piece watched it for the first time last month and had doors randomly start banging and cats screaming outside his window towards the end. Oliver, you should have watched this long ago. It's excellent. If you haven't seen it, folks, go and watch it after this episode's finished. Being shot on videotape against the creator's original wishes makes it look more homemade and authentic, and the ceiling on its quality makes it creepier. There are apparently eight common sightings of pipes in the film, though the producers have said the actual number is 13. On a big TV, we only caught two. We'll just have to watch it again. What's the worst that can happen? I hope you enjoyed that episode. Uh, like, share and subscribe. Uh, thanks for watching and please do have nightmares. Goodbye. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that episode. Like a small... Obacadeli. What? Oh, like, share and subscribe. Autocorrect has done some weird things.